Hey there, everybody. I'm Steve Taylor. Welcome to another episode of the Rocket MSP podcast. Today, I am joined by Mark Copeman. Thank you for being here, Mark. Hey, pleasure to be here, Steve. Uh, always good. Yeah. So, you know, I think it's, it's safe to say we can tell you're not from around these parts. <laughs> so why don't you tell us a little bit about, you know, who you are, your background, where you're from. Of course. So I'm, as you can tell, I'm, I'm an Englishman. I was born in London and, but I do love to travel. I, I try and pick up accents wherever I go, whether it be the States or Australia or whatever. But so, yeah, I live just near Windsor where the queen lives in her castle, not in the castle, but just near to it. And I run a, a business called Wisecurve, which produces programs, services to help MSPs and IT vendors actually to generate more business. It, it's as simple as that. I, I've had a background in, in video, in marketing. I've built up and sold a couple of marketing agencies. And 2010, probably one of my proudest moments, if I'm honest, uh, I co-founded a business called Customer Thermometer, which was pretty much the world's first one-click feedback survey tool. Uh, and I had a wonderful eight years building up that business. And that's where I discovered this MSP industry, this IT industry, which I've very much fallen in love with. And so when I exited the business in 2018, because I had nothing left to give, not because I wasn't enjoying it, but I, I just wasn't sure what was going to come next. I dived right into to this brilliant industry that we're all part of now. So yeah, that's a little bit about me. That is very cool. I'm sure at some point I'll have questions about the queen and, <laughs> <laughs> and I may not be able to answer them, but I'll give it my best. And I assume that would be, you know, confidentiality clause and, and that type of stuff. You know, obviously mum's the word. <laughs> so the customer thermometer, I have actually used that software and it, I don't remember. I think it like integrated with a couple different PSAs, maybe not as nicely as some of the other ones that can integrate, but I mean, it, at least it integrated, it told me what ticket people were, were giving me feedback about, you know, that type of stuff. And it was a pleasure to work with. Well, I, I, thank you. Even though I'm not part of the team anymore, we're still good friends. And, you know, I sat here in this room, um, on the floor, bits of paper, literally sketching out wireframes back in 2010. And it's still wonderful. Now I, I occasionally get emails come through with, uh, with little, uh, smileys on the bottom. And of course it makes me smile, you know, to create something like that, which has had an impact on, on business is always a wonderful thing. And I think the other thing I'd mentioned, Steve, as well, it's fascinating. Any, anybody that's started a business, you know, become an, an entrepreneur, it's fascinating because you think it's going to head in a particular direction. And with that business, we were both were my, myself and my co-founder, we came out of marketing agencies. And we built the service because we thought that's what was going to be uh, our target audience. It turned out actually, of course, marketing agencies picked up on it, but the big niche for us was this industry we're in. And so you have to be flexible and uh, to pick up on your point, the PSAs, you know, when we first started, we had no idea what a PSA was, let alone thinking about integrating it. So I wouldn't call it a pivot, but we did a couple of years in, we did change the service to create these um, embeddable thermometers. And I'm so glad we did because the business changed uh, completely as a result of doing that. Yeah. And like, like you kind of, you said, and I kind of alluded to the fact that, you know, there are other systems that integrate better, or I'm trying to find the camera and, and I'm doing air quotes, right? Because it's all a matter of, you know, are, th are they doing it with an API? Are they doing it with some embeddable code? You know, exactly how are they making it work, right? And I think at the end of the day, as long as you're getting the information that you're requesting, which is, am I doing a good job or not? Is it coming from? What tickets it related to? Isn't that really all that matters, right? So <clears throat> I, I use your software, if I'm being honest, because it looked like it worked well. It looked like it integrated with, with what I was using because it, it did the embeddable code and it was cost effective. Great. I'm very glad to hear it. And, and I think as well, so I would hope anyway, uh -huh. without putting words into your mouth, it, it should have got you results if you were using it correctly. It and that's what I loved about and, and still do. I love about what they are doing it, the, the simplicity. And at the time, you know, back in 2010, 2011, 
and there weren't really any competitors. It, it was a, a bit of a revelation because people were just used to receiving surveys with, you know, the traditional 10, 20 questions and you, and it just would drive you crazy as a, a responder to those or a receiver of those. But actually for the business owner sending them out, they were frustrated because their, their response rates were, you know, tiny percentages and you know, we came along and, and tried to do something about that. So it's a very enjoyable thing to do. And I'm dying to know, you know, when somebody creates something great, customer thermometer, for example, <laughs> there are other companies that will pop up and utilize a very similar concept. I mean, Still your idea, you know, let's call it what it is. They saw that it worked. They wanted to, to put their own spin on it and they make something very similar. And we don't need to name names because that's not what this is about. But what kind of feeling does that give you? Is that like, is that a little bit of, of pride? Because, you know, I've made something so cool that other people are now trying to emulate it. Or is it frustration because I've made something, I've kind of carved out this thing that nobody else is doing. And now everybody else is doing it. Bit of both, Steve, I think. I, I think probably initially it's frustration. It's like, wow, we've got competitors. But then mm -hmm. actually when you sit back and think about it, if you don't have competitors, then the chances are you're not onto something. And, you know, there's nothing harder than, than creating a marketplace and, and creating a, uh, and selling a concept to a company as opposed to a company already understanding and getting a concept and wanting it because then they're already sold on, you know, perhaps 80% of the message and you're just coming along to fit your feature set into what they're looking for. So I think it was a bit of both, but I, it was frustrating. I, I do remember it's that look, business is an emotional game and I'm sure we might get sort of touch on that. So, so often people are quite robotic when it comes to business and it's, it's very factual and it's very, it's process. And, but actually it's all about emotion and human beings from a sales perspective, from a, an entrepreneurial perspective, and you have to take the rough with the smooth, but I think. Uh, the overarching answer to your question is, in, in hindsight at least, when you have competitors in your marketplace and coming after you, that means you must be doing something right. And speaking of, if you don't have competitors, you're not doing something right. I now have my, my dog. I don't know if you hear her scratching at the door. She desperately wants in. So <laughs> I think I will let her in a moment. But... I, I want to ask you, when you started Customer Thermometer, did you expect it to get as big as it did? I'm not sure you ever have any real expectations when you start something, you know, when you're starting from literally zero. And back then, you know, 2010, you know, it could have been like 300 years ago in the SaaS industry. There just wasn't the resources and the blogs and the how-tos and the stories that you see today. So we... We very much made it up as, as we went along and, you know, you, you hope and you wish for lots and lots of dollar signs. Of course you do. But in reality, you know, you can create business plans all day. Uh, you, you have no idea what's going to happen. And I'm sure you perhaps come across the concept of the, the slow SAS ramp of death, uh, which was a, a brilliant presentation. I'm going to have a guess about eight, nine years ago by the lady that set up uh, constant contact. I think it was, and forgive me, I can't remember her name. But she puts up a, a graph of, of what people think happens in a SaaS business, which is either cut some kind of exponential curve or a lovely, great big, you know, straight line with, with a good gradient on it. Whereas actually, if you home in on that, the reality is quite different. There's huge ups and downs. There's huge swings as you, you know, you win a bunch of customers and you perhaps, you know, there's a whole bunch of churn for whatever reason. And you, you know, you think, wow, you know, we'll put this new feature in. And so next week it's, <laughs> we're going to grow like crazy. And of course you don't. So again, it, you have to sort of taper the emotion, I think, and perhaps keep your expectations quite level and, and just focus on being consistent, which I think is a, a good word. Again, I'll, I may touch on that later, depending on your questions, but I love that word. It's quite a boring word, Steve, but consistency in business. I've learned is just one of the most powerful things that we have. It really is consistency. Gosh, I hate to overuse this phrase, but consistency is key, right? So, so knowing that I'm going to record, you know, 
an episode of this podcast every week, post-produce it and get it up, creates that consistency for my own channel, for example. You know, for other people, it could be waking up at 4.30 in the morning, working out and getting a bunch of work done that they normally wouldn't be able to do during the business hours because distractions or or whatever, right? So I, I think that whatever it is, as long as you're consistent at doing it, that is going to provide you some of the best results. It's okay if sometimes you mess up, but as long as you're consistently doing it and not consistently messing up, (laughs) you're going to do a lot better than, you know, some people like that slow burn, right? And then other people want to burn bright and then just burn out immediately after that. It's more important to have that slow burn. And I think the other thing about consistency, if you are being consistent in whatever task it may be, you can quickly find out what is working and what isn't working. Mm -hmm. If you're not consistent, you don't have the data, whether it be qualitative or quantitative, I suppose, or the feelings about whether something is working or not. Um, But if you consistently turn up, then you can start to look back and go, hang on a second, this isn't working, or actually it is. And I think that's a, a really huge benefit of that concept. So when you make customer thermometer, I mean, obviously your goal was to get better insights, probably at one point for your own customers. Would you agree with that statement? Oh, absolutely. So that they could take action off the back of uh, of those interactions. Yes. But let me rephrase. I want to make sure I'm getting the right answer out of you. So when you made customer thermometer, were you like, did you have another business or were you working somewhere at the time where you were like, Man, we send out these 46 page surveys and nobody ever answers them. Gee, I wonder why was it, was it a a personal thing that you were trying to solve? A kind of, so yes, I did have another business at the time, but it was actually a previous business where I met my co-founder, a brilliant lady called Lindsay Willett, and she still runs the business, uh, which she's recently sold it actually, but we were both working at a marketing agency and we had a system in place which was built on uh, kind of tin cans and string, but it worked. And I was on the receiving end as as an account director. We sent out every month a quick email, how are you feeling about our service? And we had our four little, you know, smiley faces, sad faces, and all the rest of it. And as an account director, I was on the receiving end of a, a red light one day. It was an amber light. I'm sorry. It was an amber light. And the process we had in place was just brilliant in that if you receive an amber light, it means a client's got a problem. You pick up the phone within an hour and you get it resolved. And if you do that, it stops things festering. It stops relationships going sour because you can jump on something quickly. And I can still remember that this particular client was upset because they'd not been invited to a particular event, which we fixed up, you know, within an hour and suddenly everything was sweetness and light again. So. It was as much about the process and how it was implemented as opposed to the technology. Again, I'm bringing back the human elements here, I think, Steve. And I saw the, the power in having that quick response, that simple piece of data, you know, I don't need 20 questions to find out if a customer's upset or not. I just need them to give them the right mechanism to be able to complain or, or, or just say something's not right. So that is why we built the product to try and make it uh, available to as many people as possible. I like that. So, so yeah, one, one thing I'll say is I don't need to ask somebody 26 questions to figure out if they're mad. That's a silly approach. I just need to ask them, you mad, bro? Like, (laughs) are you mad? Yes or no? Like there's. You know, and you guys did a great job with that approach. So let's talk about help desks because I feel like help desks were like customer service, but you know, help desks in, in the sense of MSPs, right? So we are the guys who are kind of biting our fingernails in the help desk that we get all green lights. And you, I love that you call them amber over across the pond because we call them yellow. <laughs> 
you know, and Am- I'm Amber's also a- aware there is a system in the States, which we found out subsequently, uh, Amber Alerts, that's to do with a, perhaps a, a child being taken illegally, that type of yes. thing. We had no idea. So yeah. that is something we did, and I've forgotten that, Steve. Yeah, we rectified that. Well, and I was going to I was gonna make it a little lighter. I was just going to say Amber's a girl I know, and okay. yellow is a color. <laughs> so any, anyway, though, knowing... I, I love what you said. If it's yellow, if it's amber, now I know I have a problem. Yeah. And what I took away from that is if it's red, it's gone too far. Yellow is when you need to start fixing things. If, if it's red, things may not be fixable. So. Potentially may. to finish the, that, that sort of story in terms of the process that we had, if it was a red light, it meant a customer and there were just, there are always descriptions against what these buttons mean. But it was actually the, uh, the managing director, the chief exec of the business took it upon himself to call up that customer. So, you know, there was a differentiation between an amber light and a red light. So it worked brilliantly, but as I say, you have to have that human process implemented as well. Uh, You can't just rely on the technology. If you get a red light and do nothing about it, uh, then you're in all sorts of trouble. So. What are some things, I know you, you alluded to consistency. What are some things that you would say help desk agents, help desk technicians, whatever you want to call them, what, what should they be doing to ensure that they get all greens or even better or gold? Oh, I forgot there's gold. There's gold. And actually it's, I think it's an interesting point, Steve. We, it was very deliberate that there is a scale of four. So green and gold and amber and red or yellow and red. And the reason behind that was, I think it wasn't my idea. It was Lindsay's. And I still think it's genius to this day. You cannot hit a middle ground. You have to have an opinion on whether it's something, the service you're being offered is good or bad to a greater or lesser extent. And I love that. Uh, Because people, it's all too easy to hit that middle button, isn't it? So uh, it really is. So that's the background behind that, that uh, four point scale, which, you know, which isn't for everybody. Some people like the NPS thing. Some people want to, you know, a a zero to 10 or, you know, there's lots of different ways of measuring it. For me, that's just super simple. So let me come back to your question. And it's a wonderful thing. I'm putting my, you know, MSP business owner hat on here just for a moment. Whatever CSAT system you're using. It's a brilliant opportunity to have a conversation with a customer. So let's say, you know, you're getting a consistent green lights for one of a better phrase. That means it's not still as good as it could be because you then have the opportunity to go and talk to a customer and say, Hey, what do we need to do to get some regular gold stars here? What, how do we need to up our game a little bit? And so, you know, sometimes I feel CSAT just gets buried in reports and passed around internally, but actually, if you pick out some highlights, they are brilliant pieces of data to have, to start discussions around with customers and, you know, proactive discussions as well. And the nice thing about it, it's real. It's not, you're not just sort of feeling some stuff. It's not qualitative at all. It's, Hey, look, you know, this is what's going on. And, you know, I'd like to start a conversation with you. So it's valuable. I, I love that explanation of having four colors. That way it's either good or great or a poor experience or an awful experience. Exactly. Because you're right. You know, for me, when, and, and I'll say if somebody sent me even just the four, unless they've blown my mind, I've had a good experience. You know what I mean? But you know, it's far too often I'll call my cell phone provider and I work with T-Mobile and, you know, if they ask me, how, you know, have you had an excellent experience? And I'll say yes, because I know why they're asking, because, you know, if, if they don't get all tens or fives or whatever the magic number is, then they get yelled at and possibly fired. But I want to say, no, I've had, it it was fine. It was an all right experience. You know, you didn't like give me a free phone and you didn't do anything that blew my mind. (laughs) Yes. So, so I, I would say that there's like the minimally acceptable experience, which is I called and they simply provided a service 
And then there's a good experience where maybe we had a pleasant conversation while doing it. And then there's an excellent experience where they have gone above and beyond to do something that normally wouldn't be done. Mm. And, and I think that's the part where MSPs and, and the people that are working for them, that's the thing that we need to be thinking about is what can we do to take each one of these service requests and turn it into an experience that absolutely delights the individual or the company that, that we're working with. You're preaching to the converted, Steve, and, you know, to, to make the link and, and perhaps come back to your, your previous question, which I didn't really answer, but you're giving me another go at it here. So when I left customer thermometer, I, I genuinely didn't really know what was next. I didn't have a plan, but I had always wanted to, uh, to write a book and I had learned so much through helping, I'm going to say hundreds of MSPs with the CSAT, their customer service. I decided um, that's the, the path I should continue on. And there was a real desire to get better at customer service, but perhaps it's just a bit uncertain as to how do we get technicians, engineers communicating with customers in a better way. And so, you know, I mean, blatant plug, but you know, I wrote the book, which I call Help Desk Habits, which I've also turned into uh, an online program. And I'm thrilled that, you know, I've had over 1500 people now around the world have gone through that certification. And the reason behind it, the reason I think this stuff is so important is because it's assumed that technicians, engineers, in fact, anybody, frankly, if, if they're good at their, at their day-to-day -day role, they're experts in their field, then they must be naturally good at talking, saying, writing the right things to a customer. And of course that's not the case. And, and why isn't that the case is because typically they've never been shown how, and if it's not natural, it's unfair to expect a technician who's an expert in Kubernetes to be able to have a, you know, an, an engaging conversation with a customer and make them feel amazing about the, whatever problem that is that they've just been solving. And so I am genuinely passionate about helping people go through this. And the reason because the reason for it is because if you get it right and you differentiate, you get more referrals, you get more recommendations, you get better reviews and you get contract renewals because nobody likes to stop working with people who they enjoy working with, uh, unless something really terrible has gone on. But typically people buy from people. And if those relationships are sound, then you know, you never lose a customer. So those four R's for me are, are the net result of doing these things well with, with customers. I love that. So what would you say, and I know we, we've, we've kind of skimmed the top of the surface. What would you say the most important thing for a help desk agent? What's the most important thing for them to do? to have an exceptional experience? It's hard to answer that with one thing, but I'll, I will try it. And I think for me, it's about having a, 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 like a fundamental understanding of what it is that they're doing. And I won't tell the story, but I often tell a story when I'm, I'm standing up speaking and so on. It's actually about my father-in-law and about a, a, a moment because I used to <laughs> run his personal IT support, like so many of us do. For 20 odd years, but there was a moment which happened. And if you as an agent can always keep in the back of your mind that you're not dealing with it support, you're dealing with human support and actually yes. what you are going through that process of trying to help somebody at that moment, typically let's face it, if you're getting a call or an email, it's rarely to say, Hey, everything's okay. <laughs> it's pretty rare. Normally it's because someone's facing a problem and mm -hmm. that means that human being on the end of that end point, okay, it's not about the end point. It's about the human being, not being able to do their job, not being able to present something to somebody, not being able to sell something to somebody. And it follow all the way that, that all the way through, you know, it's about putting food on the table at the end of the day. It could be livelihoods at stake. I know that sounds quite dramatic, but 
if you remember that you're dealing with human support instead of just, it changes your mindset a little bit. Mm -hmm. Human customer service, something I'm really passionate about. And so I think if, if there is just one thing that you know, people perhaps take from this and they think about in their role every day about how to create a better experience for an individual MSP's customers, having that in your back, in your mind, when you start your day might just change your whole attitude and how you uh, react to customers during the process of the tickets that you're working. And, and feel free to disagree, but you know, I joke and say T-Mobile didn't give me a free phone, but you know what did make it an exceptional experience for me that day when I had that call, even though I was on the phone with that rep for an hour and a half. Wow. I mean, nothing was wrong. I, I didn't feel like going into the store. So I called in, I got a phone upgrade. I, I upgraded my wife and my watch, you know, and it just took a while to process because I had a lot of questions, but what made it such a wonderful experience was even though that person was very obviously in a different country because T-Mobile has outsourced all of their telephone, everything. I felt like we had a genuine conversation. I didn't feel like they were reading, oh, you know, I understand your concern and I would be just as upset if it were me. Like, you know, you know, you, you get those canned, like you can tell that they're just doing what they were told to do, saying the, the typical, I understand and I feel your pain. I'm, I'm here with you. Like, oh, no, this woman was like genuine. You know, we you were able to laugh about some things. She answered all my questions. She made sure that I understood, you know, any, any upgrade fees and, and everything else that, that we were about to do because, you know, like I said, questions, right? Just like we all do when we go to make what now feels like a, a freaking car purchase because an iPhone now, <laughs> you know, I, I think my phone's like a thirteen, fourteen hundred dollar phone. And that is definitely more than my first car cost. Look, I hear you. you. You've, you know, you've had an interaction and it's interesting, you know, it was memorable enough to talk about here. Mm -hmm. And so all, all credit to them that there, there's 50 habits uh, in the book and in the program, Steve, and there, there's, there's two that you've kind of just picked up on there. So one of them is around not using what I call hollow phrases, which is that script type stuff where people just say things because that's kind of what they feel they should say, even though quite often they're, they're, they're meaningless. And the second habit I, I pick up on, which is, you know, what you've just sort of referenced there is around being human, uh, be human, be you is the title of the habit. And that's partially down to you as an individual, but it's also down to the service uh, delivery manager, the, the, the business owner, call it what you will in a, in a T-Mobile sense, if you've got a you know, a thousand call center agents, then, you know, that's different again. But I, I think many of the people listening to this would likely to be small business. And so, you know, if, if they're a small team of four five, six people on a help desk, if you run that help desk or you are that owner of that MSP, empower your team, allow them to be human, to be you, allow them to, to have a joke once in a while. You know, people, I, I, I really feel that there's this sort of unwritten rule that sometimes in business where you're not allowed to smile. And I think after what, you know, we've all been through around the world over the last 18 months or so, people crave that authenticity. They crave having a conversation with somebody who's human. And I think that's so, so, so important as opposed to, of course, you need to get the job done. Don't get me wrong. You know, I'm not talking about small talk for, for 20 minutes here, but it's, oh, we've got another guest It's it's looking for that balance. And, and that's something I think. You can teach, but I think you also have to uh, get better with practice about knowing when to, to be human and knowing when to be, you know, really focused on trying to resolve a problem. And I got to say, if I make a phone call and I hear your call is important to us, mm -hmm. please continue to hold. They one still more do time. it. They still do it. I, I, I agree. I agree completely. I would rather just hear music. Like all these companies, they'll put like their commercials and they'll, you know, you're, we're still here. You're still in line. Like, no, just play some music and, or better yet, 
put silence with maybe a little chime every like 90 seconds, just so that way I know the phone didn't hang up. Sure. That way I can listen to whatever I want. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So, so you've got, you've actually got two books, don't you? Yeah. 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 Like I, I do. The, the, the second one is, is right here and I, I can, would you like me to explain how it came about? Absolutely. I, you see, the, the thing about this book, Steve, is, I mean, whilst I can claim credit for it, most of the work in here kind of isn't mine, although it was a you huge amount from, of work to put it together, to be fair. You got it all and from the, Reddit, didn't you? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, I suspect most of it wouldn't be publishable, but the, I, I think, you know, I genuinely, and I still am, in, absolutely in love with this business. I think the, this IT world that we're, so many of us are part of, I've worked in a few different verticals and by far, this is the most collaborative and just, and friendly and all those sorts of words. I'm, I'm sure there's some other adjectives as well I could think of. And I really, you know, having been fortunate enough to, you know, travel the world a bit and you know, stand up on sp stage and, and do some speaking and attending these different conferences was, it's just a brilliant experience because you get to meet so many people. And so I thought, look, I'm a great believer in not reinventing the wheel, learning from others, whether it be successes or failures. And sometimes you can learn more from failure. And so I thought, oh, do you know what? I'll spend a couple of months putting a book together. Oh, it took me about a year in the end, but that's okay. And I, I asked proactively and also to people I knew in the industry to give me their biggest secret really about their success or failure of running their MSP or how to run an MSP. So a combination of MSP owners and um, IT professionals in perhaps the vendor space as well. And as I say, about a year later, I pulled together 85 contributors and um, yeah, 101 secrets across a whole bunch of, of different areas, sales, marketing, service, recruitment, management, and at the back, some, some personal stories actually, which I really uh, enjoyed hearing and, and, and writing about because people have been quite open about the mental health side of things, actually. And I think we've, we've touched on this briefly around here, the emotions of running a small business, whatever field you may be in. And you know, it's tough. It's hard. And I'm sure people listen to this can agree with me. If you've had it easy for 10 years, then well done because it rarely <laughs> works like that. But you have to have the downs to have the ups. And that's the, the joy for me of, of small business. So Yes, that, um, the book was, was published about um, 18 months ago now, and it was, it was a real treat, uh, it's a real privilege to, to put together and Hey, maybe there's a, a, a version two, uh, one day soon. I love that. And I want to have a conversation about the mental health bit. I think that this is an important thing for MSPs to worry about something that I've learned at church is you know, the, at church, we're always talking about the spiritual, but right now I'm going to just talk about the mental. All right. So when you are providing tech support, you are actually doing a few things. You have to fix a problem after diagnosing the problem. You have to be friendly and helpful. And then you also have to be a little bit of a psychiatrist. Because the person's upset and depending on the, the level of severity that the issue or whatever that they're calling about, <clears throat> they may be freaking out, right? So not only do you have to kind of tiptoe around this whole situation and expertly troubleshoot and resolve the thing with great haste, but you also have to talk them off the ledge. And for somebody to continue to do that throughout the day, you're pouring out a lot. And, you know, if you look at my picture here, this is not intentionally half empty or half full. Okay. I just have been drinking water and it's what it is. You know, you keep pouring out, but if you don't pour back in, eventually that pitcher runs out. Okay. So for those of you that are, are constantly pouring out to your customers, to your clients who, whatever you want to think of them as you need to find a way to, to kind of refill, right? You know, for some people that's reading a book, 
for me, you know, depending on if I can get it in the view here, I've got my guitar, you know, <clears throat> people refill in different ways, but some, sometimes you just need to go have a, a beer and a conversation with a friend. Like yeah. it, you just need to, you just need to make sure that you're also doing something to have something else pour back into you. Okay. And you can take that, you know, spiritually, unspiritually, however you want. It doesn't matter if you just think about it logically. I, I, there's nothing much for me to add to that other than completely agree with you. And no one's ever mentioned to me before the way perhaps a technician may feel at the end of a day, having gone through 20 tickets and had five difficult conversations with a customer. I'll be honest, Steve, I've never thought about that from a technician engineer's perspective. And I think it's a very good point. I tend to come at this from a, a, a business owner perspective and, you know, can you make payroll next month? And we just lost a big deal and we've got three people leaving us next week, which we weren't expecting. And they, of course, also pile on the, the pressure. But I think it's, you make a great point. It's about individuals on that help desk as well. And, um, and making sure that you know, taking responsibility for yourself to look after yourself, but also it's also a responsibility of those in charge to, to make sure. And particularly with the, the new theme of remote working coming along, I've spoken to many MSPs about this and that makes things even harder as people, you know, one perhaps do a bit of hybrid working, a bit of time at home, a bit of time in the office. And you start to, if you're not careful, lose the bonds that hold people together. And uh, you have to work doubly hard to make sure that people are okay. And of course that applies to all business, not just in the MSP space. And maybe there is an opportunity there for, as, as we help people with remote working to do some education around some of the, uh, the psychological aspects as well, and best practices for, for working remotely. There's a, a, a brilliant book, uh, which came out actually a number of years ago. Uh, I'm sure you've heard of uh, Jason Fried, uh, the Basecamp founder, look up his book remote. It's kind of the Bible on this stuff. And, uh, it's really good. And this was way before any pandemics hit. So yeah, ahead of his time. And, and along the same lines, when it comes to people, I, I want you guys to remember that as a business owner, we have many different things to worry about. And we often don't remember that our employees are one of those things and not just a, can I make payroll, but sometimes they have issues. I don't know if a, you've probably never had an employee come and complain to you about anything, right, Mark? <laughs> That's right, Steve. Yeah. Yeah. It's yeah. all been plain sailing over the years. <laughs> yeah. So I mean, every now and then you might get somebody that, you know, maybe they probably just shouldn't work with your company if they're going to complain, but no, if. You know, if, if you have employees, you're going to have problems with employees, right? And it could be interpersonal. Maybe two employees don't have, uh, personality types that, that jive well together. So you're constantly putting up with people that bicker and complain about each other and maybe just cause a negative work environment and overall, right? And then you'll have the people who get along with everyone they work with, but maybe they complain about the clients because man, I can't believe this stupid idiot clicked this button when he wanted to do that thing. Like what kind of moron do you need? Like, you know, there's those people who, you know, like I sometimes struggle with like my wife or with my mom, because like, as, as dumb as that sounds, stay with me. Okay. So I'm, I'm 38. I got my first computer when I was like six or seven years old. It was a, an IBM 80286. I have no idea how much RAM or anything. It didn't even have a mouse, right? It was my mom's computer and I just was allowed to use it. And my mom has always been kind of tech savvy, but I would say over the last 15 years or so, she's kind of plateaued, you know? In fact, actually, once we stopped using DOS 6.22, that's probably, I feel like that's when she really started to taper off, you know, but once like windows seven came out, she really just kind of plateaued and it almost sometimes feel like she's declined, but I still think of her as like, you know, I don't know my dad and it's okay. We don't have to, oh, poor Steve, don't worry about it. 
I still think of my mom as like, you know, she's my superhero who knew all this cool stuff about computers. So I get so mad when she's like, hey, so this thing's happened on my phone. It doesn't even matter what the thing is. Like, how do you not know how to fix that, mom? Come on. But, you know, you, you, people stop being fascinated with things sometimes, you know, or maybe they no longer need to be a tech expert because whatever reason. And I just assume my wife is an IT expert because, you know, learning through osmosis, laying next to me, she probably just knows everything, right? <laughs> but she doesn't. And I, she, she said she, she's going to miss me, but she can't wait for me to die because she's going off the grid. <laughs> she hates technology. And it's, and it's, a, it's an ongoing joke. She doesn't actually want me to die. <laughs> But so, so, you know, for me, like even, it's even a struggle for me where sometimes you just assume people are smarter or you assume something's common sense, right? So, so then you get frustrated and you either take it out on them or you hit mute and you take it out on everyone around you. And it's just the dumb little things. Like it's not always, you know, rainbows and unicorns in the office and the higher up the food chain you go, what, you know, if you're a supervisor, a manager, director, C-level owner, the, the more people you end up actually having to manage. And for a lot of MSPs, you might be in that, like, I'm going to call it like 10 to 15 employee range, but, but maybe you've had some like explosive growth. We'll call it since the pandemic, you know, you had to help a lot of companies go from having an office to remote work from home. And now you've ended up having explosive growth because you needed all these employees. And now you're all starting to go and meet at the office. And you went from like five guys to 12 guys. And now you're dealing with all this extra interpersonal crap. And even though you've got some like managers, you maybe never officially built out that org chart, right? So people don't realize they need to, to stick with that like chain of command. They just want to go straight to the top because that's what we always did before there were managers. So what do you tell those companies, Mark? I know that was a very long winded question. So what do you <laughs> tell the MSP owners who maybe they're running a small MSP and they're starting to see some growth. They're starting to see business pick up. What can they do? now to have a great, I, I can't think of the word I'm looking for. You, you want to have a great atmosphere, right? So, or culture. Culture. What, what can I, I do now to, that, that we can more easily grow into a better culture to where even when we do have issues, it's not all coming to me, the owner. It's about empowerment, I think, Steve. I think it's about making sure that those on the front line, you know, within certain boundaries, of course, if they need to, I'm going to pick a crazy example here, but you know, if they need to, uh, get a, a an Uber and, you know, send a, a print around, uh, to, because someone needs to print out something for a big sales call, they should be allowed to do that. They should be allowed to, uh, do what they think is right based on the situation. Cause there would never be an SOP for. For, you know, that every single specific situation. And this so is where it, for me, it comes right back to this human support again. So, okay. A print has gone down. This may not be a great example, but you know, the print has gone down, print's gone down. It says in the SOP here, this is what we've got to do. And we've got to buy it in this particular way. And, you know, we're going to ship it to them and five days later, it's going to arrive. You've got a, a customer in, in pieces because they can't print this thing out to give as part of this sales call, which perhaps is going to, you know, twofold their business in some way. That's a unique situation. And so if the owner of the business isn't around and you, you shouldn't have to have to worry about those checks and balances in situations like that, you should be able to just jump in a cab, get to the, you know, the local printer shop and take it around there, set it up. And, and so there's that empowerment element. And then see if you do start to do things like that. I, uh, and then this is, I think this is linked to your question still. You get this amazing effect, which is in um, the Health Desk Habits book around this, a concept called the service recovery paradox. 
And it's simply this, if, if something goes wrong, which happens all the time in our industry, let's face it, if you fix it well, if you go you know, beyond the call, I suppose, then that customer will become more loyal to you over time. It's a proven fact. We, we will have all had examples. I've certainly got a couple of brilliant ones. And so if you combine going the extra mile with that empowerment, and not only do you as, as an individual, as a technician, get a great feeling from it, and you know the word spreads around the office and there's high fives when you get back, You've got a delighted customer because you've gone the extra mile and you've enabled them to go about their day. And success breeds success, doesn't it? You get the right sort of atmosphere going on. But flip side, everyone's locked down in their SOPs and they're following scripts and they can't go and jump in a cab and pick up a printer because they think, oh, geez, I'm not allowed to do that. The atmosphere changes completely. So uh, you hear people talking about, you know, at the end of the day, an MSP, it should be a customer service company. It just happens to deal in IT. I quite mm -hmm. like that. It's a bit of a throwaway comment, isn't it? But I think it's a great thing if you can get that in your core. And, you know, I've said that before on the podcast, and I know quite a few MSPs who kind of feel that way, that they would rather hire somebody that's great with people than somebody that's great at fixing things. I would kind of challenge them to try to do both, but. <laughs> I've had conversations with, with owners in, in your country conferences. Uh, in fact, I've stood up and we've actually, uh, I've asked for a show of hands and there's real evidence that people are going specifically to the hospitality industry, uh, where, where people are naturally gifted or talented or whatever it may be at dealing with people. And then they're putting them through certifications and they're training them mm. in the IT way. And I mean, that's fascinating to me, absolutely fascinating. And you think, well, surely that should, it should be the easier going the other way around, but there's two specific people I, I know for a fact doing this regularly and it absolutely works for them. So maybe something worth trying if you've never tried it before. Now, are they, they're, they're starting those people off at like a, a level one tier one type. I would goal, imagine right? so. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So. I, I would say that's a, probably a good idea, probably, but it's also probably a good idea. I, I don't know. Sometimes I wonder if, if we should almost have like, instead of splitting them up and having like, we're going to have a tier one guy, a tier two guy and a tier three guy. What if we paired them up together? What if we had a tier one and a tier three guy work together and the tier one guy is the one that's doing the conversations, tier three guys, the one that's clicking the buttons, because you know, it's going to go a lot faster if the tier three guy just does it. But he uses tier one guy for translation, if you like, and going back to that customer. Yes. So, so really what I would say would almost make like the, the perfect, and I'm just saying tiers because we talked about bringing in the hospitality person and putting them in a tier one position. But if we were to get somebody who's just great at having conversations mm. and, and put them in the conversation role, and then we've got, you know, in you know, same little office, two guys, two guys in an office, two desks, but maybe they're like, next to each other, back to back, however you want to do it. Right. And the one guy is doing all the heavy lifting, which means he's doing all the talking to the customer and the other guy's just fixing the problem. <laughs> Think of how great that would be because now you have one guy who he is free to get the work done. Because if you think about it, sometimes people just don't want to hang up. They want to talk to you and kind of watch you while you fix the problem, right? <laughs> and now it's taking you three times as long because you're trying to do two things at once. Well, you're trying to do like six things at once or, or whatever the number is, because you're trying to think about the problem. You're trying to think of how to resolve it. And then you're trying to move the mouse and, and click the keys, right? But then you're also trying to listen to what they're saying. So now we're at four, right? So you're trying to listen to what they're saying process it and then move your mouth and make noises to hopefully make a, a halfway decent response. That is literally six things that your brain is processing all at once. And you know, how many times have we 
read in the books or, or in journals or seen people talk about, you can't multitask. You always do a better job when you are single task oriented. Well, being on the phone with somebody and trying to fix their problem is not single task oriented. Very true. Yes. Play to your strengths, I think you're saying. Mm hmm So... So as an MSP, and, and who knows, maybe I'm wrong, maybe I just waste somebody's money, but it's not my money. I'm really good at spending other people's money. Hmm. I want to know what it would be like to do that, to pair up uh, a people person and a, a you know, high intelligence technical person and, and just partner them together and have one deal with the people while the other fixes the problem. How much faster would things get done? You might just have stumbled across something there. I've not come across that working or, or, or anyone trying it before, but you never know. Yeah, how, how much fast, not only how much faster would things get done, but think of, you know, no more escalations. It's like that song, Imagine. <laughs> <laughs> no, no more escalations. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well. Mark, what do you, do you have anything else that you would like to have us think about before we let you go? I have a whole bunch of notes down here, which I've not really used to be honest oh, with you, no. but that's okay. That's all right. Cause I wasn't quite sure where this conversation was going to go. Okay. I'm still not. <laughs> and I'm glancing at them now and I, I, I think it's always good to pick, take one thing from a conversation, as I mentioned at the beginning. And I think that, that one change of attitude about remember the human beings on the end of the endpoints, uh, might just sow a seed or two with people listening. Uh, and if it does, I'm, I'm delighted. There's a lot more behind that and there's a lot more to do, but if you can remember that as part of your day to day, then I think things will slowly start to change in, in how you start to naturally deal with customers. And at the end of the day, we're, it doesn't matter how much AI, doesn't matter how many bots will be around as far as I'm, I know, as long as I'm going to be alive, hopefully people will always want to deal with other human beings at the right point. Not always. I accept that completely. But I do believe just as we've done over this last hour, you know, you thrive off of, of people. And I don't think that's going away anytime soon. And I hope it doesn't because that for me is the real differentiator when it comes to a customer choosing their IT partner and not just choosing them in the first place, but staying with them. So that's perhaps my final message. Thank you so much, Mark, for coming on and, and chatting with me. Can you, can you toss those books up for me one more time? Yeah. I want to make sure people see them. Guys, check these books out. Help Desk Hab Habits, Help Desk Habits, and MSP Secrets Revealed. Check them both out. Where, where can we get them, Mark? You'll find those on Amazon. Steve, of course, like, like anything else, perhaps put an anvil in your, in your cart at the same time and, you know, test it out. But so, yeah, you'll find those on Amazon. And if you go to wisecurve.co.uk, you'll see the other services which I offer and any, I love hearing one of the things I, the last thing I'll say, I love that the help desk habit stuff, MSPs around the world. And one of the biggest joys is receiving emails from different corners of the planet and seeing pictures of people holding out their certificates. And so if anybody's got any questions, wants to continue the discussion, um, please drop me a line through the site. It's always a pleasure. You will always get a response from me. I love that. Thanks again, Mark. For those of you that are still here with us, check out the description uh, or the show notes, whatever you want to call it, to get links to purchase or check out his books. I'm almost positive you could probably get a Kindle version too. You absolutely can. Yeah. And then you'll also have a link to learn more about Wise Curve and more about Mark. So I strongly encourage you to do that. And finally, if you could like and subscribe, not just to this video, but to this channel to, you know, just get great content like this. Thanks so much for watching and we will catch you. Well, I will catch you at the next one. Mark, I mean, maybe you will. Who knows? <laughs> it's been a pleasure, Steve. Thanks for having me on. Absolutely. Take care, everybody.